Um, but yes, just as it was mentioned tonight, uh, we are going to be going over the study about God's kingdom. Um, now, if you're visiting with us tonight, we're, uh, what we're going through right now is just a, ser a study series. Um, we have a series of studies uh, where we uh, where we go out and we teach these uh, uh, these lessons out to uh, to everyone. And so tonight, we're going to be going over the coming of the kingdom. Um, now. In this study, um, you'll see the continuity of the Old and the New Testaments. You'll see that the Old Testament is in perfect unity with the New Testament. Uh, there are some people that believe that, you know, the Old Testament kind of contradicts what the New Te uh, Testament says, but the Bible isn't written to contradict itself. It's written to harmonize with itself. Um, so in this um, so in this study, we uh, first of all, you want to uh, make sure that uh, you take note of six main dates throughout the study, and we're going to be covering those. Mm -hmm. And we'll also uh, be asking two important questions to the person who is studying the Bible. Uh, the first question is, what would you say is the kingdom of God? That's the first question. And second is, when did it come? Mm -hmm. So we're going to be going over these different predictions. And so if you, um, so, I'm a bit of a visual learner. Um, mm -hmm. So usually what I do whenever I do this study with people, I usually have, uh, we usually have the, the, a fellow Christian uh, come accompany us in the study and we normally have them take the notes what I like to do is actually have the person studying take the notes uh, mm -hmm. because it really allows them to actually kind of keep track because when you're when you're being fed a whole lot of information it's very easy to get lost in the study mm -hmm. but if you have the person just taking down the notes themselves they can actually uh, follow mm -hmm. along quite easily yeah. um, so we're gonna first we're gonna cover the um, uh, the Old Testament predictions of the kingdom now this um, this date right here is 1000 BC. This is during the, uh, the height of Israel's glory when it was under the kingship uh, of David. This is when, uh, uh, during the time when Israel was just in glory. It was, mm. it was prospering. But we're going to fast forward to our first scripture in Isaiah 2, 1 through 4. What's going on right now is that Isaiah is prophesying about the kingdom, and this is in 750 BC. Uh, so this is about two, this is 250 years later, uh, and this is during a time where this is during one of the darker times of uh, Israel, and it says in verse one, "This is what Isaiah son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, 'Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us this.'" excuse me, his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. So uh, the question that we, uh, that we have here is, when will it take place? And it says, and what will take place? So there are four things that we need to take note of from the scripture about uh, the kingdom that Isaiah is prophesying. The first one is, when will it take place? It'll take place in the last days. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, it says, uh, it talks about mountains. Now right here, uh, at this time, mountains was actually a symbolism for kingdom. So if you took out the word mountain and substitute for the word kingdom, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, thirdly, it says that all nations will stream to this kingdom. And then uh, lastly, it says the word will go out from it, from, starting from Jerusalem. So these are four things that we need to take note of from this scripture right here. And if, um, and again, usually I would have the person uh, sit down and write everything down. They're basically going to be writing a little checklist for themselves. Mm -hmm. So once they've written that down, we'll be moving to our next scripture, which is in Daniel <laughs> chapter 2, verse 31 to 45. And if, um, if you have your Bibles, uh, feel free to flip there. Now at this time in Daniel... Uh, we're now fast forwarding 200 years later into 550 BC. Now to give you a little bit more context, um, I, I know that I mentioned that in 750 BC, Israel was going through some dark times. This is even darker than, uh, than the previous scripture. Um, at this time, uh, Babylon was known as the, um, as the most powerful empire in the, uh, in the entire known world. And, um, and this story is, in, is involving uh, the king of Babylon, which is, uh, who is uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Now starting in verse 31, um, oh, and to provide a little bit more context, at, at this point, uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, has a dream, and he goes to his astrologers, and he tells them, hey, I want you to tell me what the dream is and what it means. At that time, they were saying, oh, we can tell you what it means. You just need to tell us the, uh, what it was that you dreamt. And he said, no, 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 no. I want you to tell me what I dreamt and what it means, or else I'm going to kill you. Mm -hmm. But so what happens, is, you know, these guys are like, man, this isn't fair. Like, you know, we don't know. We can't interpret if you, if you can't tell us. So Daniel comes in. And he decides, you know what, I'm going to come in and I'm going to tell you what this dream is and I'm going to interpret it 
uh, for you. This isn't going to be my interpretation. This is going to be God's interpretation. So starting in verse 31, it says, You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest of arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It shook the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will rise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything, and as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with the baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. So, right here, we, and this is a long passage <laughs> that, we, that we just went through, but we see that Daniel is interpreting uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And so he's going over this statue, and he's talking about the gold, the silver, the bronze, uh, the iron and clay. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so he's talking about, he's saying that the head um, is made out of gold. Now at this time, um, this was supposed to represent the most powerful empire at that time, which was uh, used to represent uh, the, ba uh, the Babylonian Empire. Mm -hmm. Then he mentioned that the, that the statue had um, a chest of silver, which, met, uh, which represented the Medo-Persian Empire. And then following that, um, the belly, of, uh, belly and thighs of bronze, that was supposed to represent the time of Alexander the Great. And then following that, uh, he talks about the, uh, the feet and the, the legs that were made of iron and clay, which represented the Roman Empire. Now, with the Roman Empire, uh, the reason why it was used as, uh, it was represented as iron and clay is because at that time, the nations that they conquered were also, you know, being brought, um, they were basically being brought into them. And, um, and so that's why it was made out of iron and clay. So they weren't really mixed together, just, as, just the same as the nations that they conquered weren't really uh, united with the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of information, but, um, but carrying on, it says that a rock that was cut out, not by human hands, therefore it was obviously cut out by God. It says that it came down and it struck uh, the foot of the, of the, this statue right here so and we remember that the foot represents the Roman Empire so when it struck the statue the statue and the statue basically broke down and then all of a sudden the rock itself that came down became a huge mountain mm -hmm. um, and it says that the uh, that the uh, the rock or rather the mountain will itself endure forever meaning that this is what the kingdom is going to be like the kingdom is a place that will never ever be destroyed um, a lot and um, so now we're going to go into the New Testament predictions of the kingdom. And first we're going to uh, go over John the Baptist. And it's in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Okay. All right, cool. And it says, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So we're fast forwarding from, uh, from 550 BC all the way now, down to uh, 25 AD. And this is during the time of John the Baptist. And so at this time, has the kingdom come yet? No. No, no exactly. 
And so what are you saying? So we can see that even though it's been a few hundred years that have passed by, the kingdom still hasn't come. But yet all the way back in 750 BC, Isaiah, Isaiah uh, prophesied that the kingdom will be coming. Mm -hmm. So it's been over 700 years and the kingdom still hasn't come. John, uh, John the Baptist is now saying it's coming. It's, it's near, but it's not exactly here yet. Mm -hmm. So let's fast forward to 30 AD in, in the time of Jesus. In Matthew 4, 17, Jesus said, <clears throat> from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Mm. So once again, five years later, we see that the kingdom still hasn't even arrived. Mm. And so we're going to go over um, a couple of things here. So the note, uh, the note says the kingdom will come in the lifetime of some of the disciples. In uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 1, it says, and he said to them, I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. So usually, so what Jesus is doing right here, he's talking to a group of disciples and he's saying, some of you um, who are standing here are, are, will not taste death. So that pretty much implies that someone within that group is going to die when the kingdom comes. Hmm. So we're going to, uh, and also in what's um, noted here as well, it says that, uh, that the kingdom of God will come with power. So those are two things that we need to take note of here um, with the person who's studying the Bible. John chapter 3 in verse 1 through 7, it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus that night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. So in order for us to, to enter into the kingdom right here, Jesus himself says it. In order for us to enter, we must be born of the water and the spirit. Mm -hmm. Now you can ask the person, you know, what do you think the water represents? You can ask them what the spirit represents. Maybe the person might get a little excited and try to say, oh yeah, it means this, it means that. It, you know, the water definitely means baptism. But the thing is with this study, we want to make sure, um, I know that some of us can get really excited and go like, yeah, yeah, definitely, you're right. But we want to make sure that we allow the Bible to explain itself. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what the study is going to do later on. So uh, we just continue pressing forward. Okay, right. And in uh, Luke 17, verses 20 to 21, mm -hmm. it says, Once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, Here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. So another thing to take note of here is that what Jesus is saying um, is that the kingdom is not meant to be a physical place. It's meant to be a place that is spiritual. Mm -hmm. So you, it's, it, the kingdom is not a place where you can just like look at it and go, that building right there, that's the kingdom right there. It's a spiritual place that, that you can't see, but it's amongst the disciples. Mm -hmm. Matthew 16, verse 13 to 19, it says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. What do you, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So in this scripture right here, um, we see that, um, you know, Jesus is asking his disciples, you know, who do people say uh, who I am? And then, uh, and then they say, oh, yeah, some people believe that you're, you know, you're this prophet, you're that prophet. And he goes, well, what about you guys? You know, wh who do you say I am? And then uh, Peter was the one who comes forward and he says, you are the Messiah. And so basically, you know, Jesus, he responds going, you know, ding, ding, ding. You got the right answer. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And so the thing is, with keys, what do they, what do they usually do? Unlock. Yeah, they unlock. They open doors. Exactly. So we can see right here that Peter is going to be the one to be able to unlock or open the door to the kingdom of God. And so some people will, um, will argue. It says uh, in the note below, it says, Church and the kingdom are the same, and we will be built on the truth that is Jesus Christ. And so some people will, will argue saying, um, you know, Peter was the one. Since he had the keys, you know, uh, it was, it was uh, built on the foundation of Peter. But the thing is, in uh, 1 Corinthians 3.11, it says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, mm -hmm. which is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So in uh, 
moving along in, in uh, Luke chapter 23, verse 50 to 51, it says, Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from, Ju uh, from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God. So at this point right here, we, we have this guy called Joseph of, uh, of Arimathea, and it says that he was still waiting for the kingdom of God after Jesus had died. So during the lifetime of Jesus, some people think that, um, that the kingdom came right when Jesus died. But we see that after Jesus had already died, uh, the kingdom still hasn't even come yet. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to Luke chapter 24, verse 44 to 49. Come on, Tyrone. It says, He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be priests in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So one of the things that we'll, um, that we'll have to take note of here, or rather the person who is studying, what they'll have to take note of, is that repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached first in where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Exactly. To who? All, All nations. nations. Exactly. So we can see that the New Testament lines up with the very first scripture that we went over in, in Isaiah. Mm. So, it, so again, it, this, this study is really meant to show how the Old Testament and the New Testament, they, they harmonize with one another. They're not made to, uh, to contradict one, uh, one another. Mm. Um, so... Moving on, so we've collected all of these clues. We've collected the, the prophecies from the Old Testament and the prophecies from the New Testament. And so now we're just going to go see the fulfillment of the Old and the New Testament predictions. And um, should I go over this? Read the whole thing? For the sake of time? Yeah, so, so for the sake of time, um, we'll start in chapter 2. Um, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that, they are, uh, that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to, to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who, li who live in Jerusalem, li let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what I know. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with your joy. In, in, with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him out an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. 
exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For day make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this, gener this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So, um, so following uh, following that, um, you can see all of these different points down here. So this is um, everything that you see that's written underneath uh, these verses should be um, everything that uh, the person has listed on their on their checklist. So the point is, um, like I had mentioned before, the scriptures that we covered in both the Old and the New Testament. Um, should have been uh, written down mm -hmm. so that you can be able to read along um, that passage that I just read, including chapter one. I skipped over that one, but make sure to cover chapter one and chapter two so that you can be able to basically check everything off that list. Mm -hmm. And if you and if you see it, um, at, uh, the points below, uh, points pretty much A through K, you can see all of um, how that part of Acts actually lines up with all of the prophecies that were mentioned. Yeah. So in conclusion. Uh, we can see that the church is the kingdom of God on earth, and it was established in approximately 33 AD. So, in, uh, moving along, in uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So, as citizens of the kingdom and members of the body, which is the church, uh, what we must be devoted to is, firstly, from the scripture right here, is doctrine. Mm -hmm. Secondly, is fellowship. Thirdly, breaking of bread, and last, to prayer. These, when you see these four things in a church, these are the signs of a true church. Mm. And the last scripture uh, comes from Matthew 6.33. It says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. I know that the question right here says, Are you willing to commit yourself to at least Friday, Friday Bible talks, Sunday services, and midweek services? Mm. This is the point in time where you challenge the person who is studying the Bible to come to every single meeting of the body. I know that uh, this is a scripture that was covered first in um, in Matthew. I'm sorry, in the Seeking God study. So if you've already gone through the Seeking God study, that that scripture should look very familiar to you. Mm -hmm. uh, but this this study right here is supposed to really give you an in depth uh, study of what God's kingdom is and how important it is to uh, to seek that first. And uh, with that, that person should be moved by this study um, and should be really fired up to seek every uh, meaning of the body. And with that, that was the kingdom study. Yeah. Yeah.